Good afternoon, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me. It's my first time at this uh, conference, and uh, I must say I found it absolutely uh, fascinating uh, this morning to uh, listen to the analyses. And thank you for your interest in, in NATO and NATO's role in the fight against um, terrorism. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in today's globalized world, the NATO alliance must uh, simultaneously monitor and assess a multitude of different threats. Um, uh, the most important ones, uh, very briefly, I would name as conventional military threats, uh, hybrid warfare, and international uh, terrorism. Of course, there are many others, but, 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 but these are really in the forefront of our um, interests and uh, activities. Uh, but let me focus exclusively on the uh, uh, terrorist uh, threats on uh, how we see them and what NATO's role is in uh, fighting uh, terrorism. And there's probably more than uh, many of you um, may, um, uh, may know or may have uh, um, uh, seen. From uh, uh, NATO's perspective, the overall security situation has become ever more complex. And in order to successfully address uh, today's challenges, uh, we must um, maintain um, a very high level of flexibility uh, to adjust to changing realities. And I would say this is particularly true uh, in the past uh, four years, uh, since uh, 2014. And I'm saying that because um, of uh, uh, the Russian invasion in, in, in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea on the one hand, um, and uh, the um, uh, um, emergence um, uh, of uh, ISIL Daesh as a, as a global threat, really. NATO has um, many years of counterterrorism experience, and in recent years has taken um, uh, an increasingly active role in this area, both on the harder, the direct action side of CT, counterterrorism, and on the softer side as well. Uh, where we focus on helping partners uh, build the capabilities to counter threats within their own uh, borders. So what are the key threats from a NATO perspective that we currently uh, face? Very much in the forefront um, has been um, ISIL Daesh. And as you all know, uh, last year uh, ISIL Daesh experienced significant territorial losses in U Iraq and Syria, and it's now close to total territorial defeat. However, despite these losses, and uh, I generally agree very much with the picture that emerged from the great panel before lunch, uh, the group was able actually to execute more terrorist attacks. Uh, our number is 4,612 um, worldwide than any other extremist group. And in terms of percentages, the number of terrorist attacks conducted globally decreased by 22% uh, last year. However, the number of ISIL Daesh attacks uh, rose by almost 9%. So uh, the threat is by no means uh, over, uh, and sometimes the um, uh, territorial, the, the almost total territorial defeat may create that um, impression, but that is certainly not at all true. These numbers demonstrate uh, one thing, that terrorist groups are able to adjust their modus operandi in a relatively short time. Throughout late 2016 and 2017, a senior ISIL Daesh leaders adapted the organization to new realities by, for example, granting greater autonomy to its branches and regional affiliates. And we estimate that ISIL Daesh still has around uh, 30,000 members in uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, and I know this is a number that was recently um, also um, uh, stated by the, uh, by the UN. Uh, we estimate that of these roughly 30,000 uh, 18 to 20,000 are still uh, fighters. Uh, so this is really a very high number, and uh, it's around 50% of the, of the peak number, which was, I think, 39,000 
foreign fighters in Iraq and in Syria. Their main areas of operations are Kirkuk and uh, Nineveh provinces, Al Anbar, um, Al Salah Al Din in Iraq, and along the middle Euphrates River Valley and the eastern desert in Syria. But uh, really, the uh, the large majority of, of these people have gone um, underground um, and are now uh, in other parts of, of, of uh, Syria um, and Iraq. And much like Al-Qaeda, ISIL Daesh is transforming from a, a centralized hierarchical structure into a decentralized ideological movement. We are observing with great concern that despite intense efforts by the international community to defeat ISIL Daesh, the ideological power of the group and its ability to inspire individuals has not diminished. For example, in 2017 we noted a shift away from directed, more complex attacks towards more inspired attacks in which so-called lone wolves motivated by ISIL Daesh but who do not have any direct contact with the group carry out acts of terror. While these attacks have proven less sophisticated and caused fewer casualties, their terrorizing effect has nevertheless been very significant. And uh, to facilitate this transition, ISIL Daesh has adapted its uh, propaganda and uh, recruitment tactics with a clear focus on inciting individuals to conduct attacks in their home countries. This group uses social media platforms continuously working on their cyber capabilities to reach and recruit potential sympathizers. Now, uh, a, a very a uh, worrisome trend is the group's concerted effort to use propaganda to radicalize women and, and minors um, who have emerged as a, as a new target uh, group for recruitment relatively recently. This trend may have led to increased involvement of women and minors in the planning and execution of uh, a number of attacks, including in NATO countries. The role of women within ISIL Daesh structures used to be uh, more or less restricted to the home with the exception of recruitment activities which women within ISIL Daesh engaged in from the onset of the establishment of the caliphate. However, since 2016, uh, women have taken on more operational roles uh, within ISIL Daesh. For example, there has been a market increase in the number of female suicide bombers and women taking on more operational roles in recruitment and social media activities. And uh, equally we are seeing ISIL Daesh increasingly uh, targeting children and minors in their propaganda and their indoctrination efforts, particularly the children of ISIL Daesh members and supporters uh, or women and children returning from Iraq and Syria could constitute uh, the next generation of extremists. Minors returning from ISIL Daesh held areas likely experienced lengthy exposure to the group's um, ideolo ideology and uh, uh, experienced psychological trauma. Uh, this makes them both victims and potential perpetrators. Given these developments, it is increasingly important to understand the factors that can make an individual vulnerable to radicalization. And this, of course, is a very complex task, um, as there is no single uh, path to terrorism and consequently no model to predict who will become radicalized. The potential threat of um, foreign fighters returning to NATO member nations is, um, of course, a, a, a particular concern to, to us and has been widely uh, discussed. And uh, uh, many actually anticipated a higher number of uh, foreign fighters returning from uh, Iraq and Syria to 
uh, to Europe and, and, and North, North America, a so-called starburst ef effect uh, that didn't happen to the extent that was um, predicted by, by many. But um, I would still argue that then that the number of um, foreign terrorist fighters uh, that have returned uh, already is still is still very significant and and, and very dangerous. Um, and even a smaller number of returnees who are highly trained and have battlefield um, experience uh, are a potentially very significant threat and can strengthen local or homegrown terrorist networks. We also we are also seeing um, movements uh, from Iraq and Syria to uh, to other theaters to other places. Uh, uh, Sinai, for for instance, uh, uh, in smaller numbers. Um, Afghanistan, Afghanistan uh, in slightly uh, higher numbers. Now, while those numbers are relatively small, uh, uh, we also judge that individuals who are motivated to continue fighting after what they have experienced in Iraq and Syria uh, in another theater are amongst the most uh, committed and hardened and therefore dangerous uh, fighters. Looking ahead, we are uh, much concerned uh, with the terrorist potential use of uh, commercially available uh, technologies uh, such as uh, drones and, uh, and electronics. And since the end of um, um, 2016, uh, we have observed increasingly sophisticated weaponized commercial drones being used in Iraq and Syria. And terrorists demonstrated use of armed, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, UAVs, in theaters of operation remain a, a very acute concern, um, especially since extremists uh, could misuse UAV technologies in a similar way against civilians uh, uh, inside NATO countries too. We are also concerned that uh, terrorists could attempt to execute an attack with an explosive device that is undetectable by, by X-ray and could be detonated uh, remotely using a cell phone. NATO has uh, undertaken efforts to uh, address the misuse of drones. So we've started to, to do that. We provide multiple frameworks to support capability development for countering terrorists' misuse of UAVs, including within the armaments, uh, science and technology, and industry communities. So far, terrorists um, have not used chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear, so-called CBRN, weapons uh, to the extent predicted and uh, feared. However, um, concern is rising over the threat of attacks employing chemical or biological substances. Terrorist groups aim to gain chemical biological capabilities and unfortunately these agents can be difficult for security forces to detect due to their or at least due to their varying nature and a recent case uh, in point and uh, probably all uh, um, have uh, noted uh, this was the discovery of uh, ricin in my own country, in an apartment in Cologne, uh, Germany, where a Tunisian man um, suspected to have been inspired by ISIL Daesh was arrested. He had acquired um, over 3,000 castor beans and had already turned some of them into ricin. This case illustrates the threat of bioterrorism uh, in Europe, and in the first case, um, of a suspected terrorist successfully producing a toxic biological agent in Europe. Acquiring nuclear materials remains uh, much more difficult. Some terrorist organizations have attempted to manufacture dirty bombs. Um, ISIL Daesh supporters, for example, uh, which involve uh, using conventional explosives to disperse radioactive material and contaminate a wide area. Now, in 
general, uh, ISIL Daesh uh, and its affiliates continue to be the most um, potent terrorist threat to global security, despite a market decrease in fatalities associated with ISIL Daesh attacks due to the group's increased focus on low-cost, low-tech um, attacks instead of complex attacks. We expect um, the trend of inspired low-cost, low-tax attacks to continue, posing a particular challenge because these types of attacks require little to no communications, uh, training, planning, and other red flags that typically provide indicators and warning of a potential uh, attack, and that's what makes them so particularly dangerous. Uh, however, um, and I was glad uh, there was uh, a lot of mention of Al-Qaeda this, uh, this morning, uh, ISIL Daesh's weakening has provided Al-Qaeda with an opportunity to attempt to regain its former status. While ISIL Daesh has occupied the world's attention for the last four to five years, Al-Qaeda has been quietly rebuilding its global networks and capabilities. Um, it has uh, established, for example, a new affiliate in Kashmir. It has researched in Afghanistan, and uh, the group has fortified and expanded its presence in, in Syria, in Yemen, of course, uh, in Somalia, and in large parts of uh, North Africa. Therefore, uh, we certainly must not underestimate Al-Qaeda, as it clearly seeks to benefit from the, the weakening of ISIL Daesh, and um, also, accordingly, has uh, uh, recently increased its uh, propaganda activities, rather like ISIL uh, Daesh. Al-Qaeda's strategic aim is to regain leadership over uh, like-minded militants and extremists. The competition for uh, legitimacy uh, affiliates and uh, recruits among the two major global extremist groups potentially increases the terrorism threat to NATO and our partners. And now I'd, I would like to say a few words about uh, what NATO does, how NATO uh, is involved in fighting terrorism. Now, uh, on the harder direct action side, uh, the Alliance has been active since at least 2001, um, uh, when uh, NATO's Article 5 was invoked for the first and only time in history um, in response to the 9-11 terrorist um, attacks. And this led to uh, NATO's ISAF mission, <coughs> excuse me, which has meanwhile been succeeded by the resolute support a mission with uh, uh, over 16,000 personnel still uh, from NATO member states and partner countries deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, while uh, ISAF was a combat mission, Resolute Support is a training and assistance uh, uh, mission that um, helps to build capacity uh, of Afghan national security and defense institutions. Much of this assistance is designed to help the government of Afghanistan uh, more effectively fight terrorism and ensure stability so that it will never again become a safe haven for uh, international terrorists. NATO has also worked to ensure that when actively engaged in CT operations, our troops have the right tools to protect uh, themselves and also local populations. For instance, we established the Defense Against Terrorism program of work in 2005 to develop techno technologies and capabilities to protect troops and civilians from non-conventional attacks. Although the Alliance does not perform a combat uh, role in the efforts to defeat ISIL Daesh. NATO decided to become a full member of the global coalition uh, to defeat ISIL Daesh um, uh, just over a year ago, in, in May 2017. And of course, it provides support through the deployment of uh, NATO 
AWACS aircraft. NATO's role within the global co coalition to defeat ISIS will evolve as the coalition moves from combat operations to uh, stabilization efforts. And in terms of enhancing our engagement with partner countries and international actors, NATO has unique strengths that make us a valuable contributor. In particular, the, uh, we aim for the highest level of uh, professionalism within our militaries. Many nations understand this and seek partnership with NATO, which gives us um, a unique opportunity to project stability, uh, that is the term we, we use, project stability into regions of uh, concern. And some of our particular strengths lie in civilian military crossover areas, such as capabilities to counter asymmetric um, attacks, standards to enable interoperability, training and advice on crisis management and civil, civil emergency planning, and assistance on security and defense sector reforms. Recognizing these strengths, uh, in May uh, last year, the uh, heads of states and uh, governments um, of NATO met in, in, in Brussels uh, and adopted um, an action plan, a comprehensive uh, action plan to enhance the alliance's role in the international community's fight against terrorism. Um, there are um, many um, uh, areas covered here which range from awareness and analysis to operations, governments, and strategic communications. Um, NATO training and capacity building in Iraq exemplifies how we have uh, leveraged um, our strengths to assist a, an important partner um, in the fight against terrorism. We assist the Iraqi government in countering improvised explosive devices, civil military planning, civil emergency planning, security sector uh, reform. And building on these um, activities um, at the most recent NATO summit uh, in July, Allied leaders launched a non-combat training and capacity building mission in, in Iraq. So um, uh, a, a wider mission than, than we have had before, which will provide additional support to Iraq's efforts to stabilize the country and to fight terrorism. Now, this decision has been taken, and now we are uh, starting to, uh, to implement uh, this mission. NATO also has undertaken steps to enhance its engagement with many uh, other international uh, actors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would highlight uh, the European Union. Uh, uh, we uh, continue to coordinate and synchronize our efforts with the EU to fill critical gaps and to reduce redundancies and ensure uh, coherence. Um, many of the threats to NATO apply equally to, to the EU. Uh, furthermore, there is a Mediterranean uh, dialogue uh, that was launched in uh, 1994, and we have been developing relationships with the African Union, with the G5, uh, and the Global Counterterrorism Forum, to name uh, just a few. Now, uh, one or two words about uh, what I do myself, um, uh, and uh, I'm glad uh, uh, it was uh, mentioned uh, already. Uh, before um, the um, changing uh, security uh, uh, environment has made it uh, necessary to uh, um, increase um, our cooperation uh, in the intelligence and, and, and security uh, field. So uh, two years ago, um, Allied leaders decided to to create um, an eighth division at headquarters, the Joint Intelligence and Security uh, Division. It's also the first uh, completely fused military and civilian um, 
division and um, I started my, my job uh, on the 1st of December uh, 2016 and my first mission was to actually stand up this, this new division and, and uh, ensure that um, uh, it's, it, it starts working well. We do st so-called strategic in intelligence um, in, in my division at, at, at headquarters. Uh, so this, uh, this is not about uh, tactical or, or operational, but it's, uh, it's uh, really the, the bigger trends um, uh, where, where things are going. And um, we also don't uh, collect our own uh, intelligence, but we receive uh, uh, intelligence from our member states. And we, our main job is to, f to come up with a fused um, uh, intelligence uh, uh, picture. Um, and I'm almost uh, through. Maybe two more sentences, if I may. Is this NATO time? Um, uh, <laughs> NATO time. <laughs> Um, and let me just finish by, by mentioning one project uh, which is on, on biometrics. Um, NATO has been uh, c uh, collecting biometric uh, data um, in operational theaters um, that is uh, by military for force, force protection and uh, we have uh, uh, developed a new policy uh, which will make it possible to share biometric data also with civilian actor, with actors with uh, civilian intelligence services and, and, and police. This is actually technically and legally uh, quite complicated and, and we're uh, very glad that uh, uh, we've been able to expand our, um, our activities in this, in this area. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.